Chicago police are stumped when a millionaire heiress vanishes without a trace. They can't believe that somebody so rich and powerful could just disappear. Twelve years later, a dogged prosecutor picks up the case. And I develop a, a little methodology that I, I would refer to as follow the fraud, solve the murder. He discovers a shady horse trader with a history of cheating rich widows out of millions. Someone come by and look at a horse, wine and dine them, before you know it, they buy a horse. It's business. Richard Bailey is one of the greatest con men in American history. Did the con man kill the candy heiress? Find out tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. February 1977, one of Chicago's richest women stepped out of the Mayo Clinic and into crime history. Eccentric 65-year-old heiress Helen Brock was due in Florida the next week, but she would never arrive. Despite an investigation that lasted years, police were unable to ever learn what happened to Helen Brock. It continues to go on and no one can believe that someone hasn't cracked and told what happened or where her body is. When Helen vanished, she left behind a sprawling estate, five luxury cars, including a lavender Rolls Royce, a dozen dogs, and what looked like plenty of motive for murder, a $30 million fortune. The police talked to everyone who was close to the reclusive widow, her brother, her houseman, and the man many thought was her lover, Richard Bailey. The police had suspects, but they couldn't find a body or a murder weapon. And while there was no hard evidence, there was no shortage of speculation. The case had Chicago buzzing. It's a mystery, and people love a mystery. It was perhaps the most famous unsolved crime in Chicago history. The mystery of Helen Brock's disappearance puzzled investigators for years. A rich widow, a charming con man, and gangsters mixing with millionaire horse owners. When the truth started to emerge, it blew the lid off the dirty secrets of Chicago's high society. Helen Voorhees Brock was born in 1911 into a working-class family in the rural town of Unionport, Ohio. Her father was a streetcar driver and her mother a housewife. Helen grew up beautiful. Her looks got her noticed, but they brought her no luck. She divorced her first husband when she was only 21. After that, the men she attracted never seemed to stick around. For the next 17 years, Helen worked odd jobs around Ohio, but her life was going nowhere. In 1950, Helen left for Florida, hoping for something better. She struck gold almost immediately. She met Frank Brock as a hat check girl at the Indian Creek Country Club in Florida. Frank Brock had inherited the largest candy company in America, a multi-million dollar empire based in Chicago. The 60-year-old candy mogul was married, but within a year, he had a new wife, 39-year-old Helen. <laughs> From being a... Uh... Um, you know, a cigarette girl to having almost unlimited resources. They had a great life together. Helen moved into Frank's 18-room mansion in Glenview, a ritzy suburb of Chicago, where Helen began to live the high life. Frank had racehorses, and he introduced her to the uh, horse world by owning racehorses. They would go up and uh, wine and dine with other horse owners up in the grandstands in Florida and, and in Illinois. It was what they enjoyed to do. Helen and Frank traveled frequently between their Grand Chicago estate and a Florida penthouse. 
Frank lavished Helen with her favorite things, antiques, jewelry, and luxury cars. Helen liked her cars pink and white, like Brock's candies. In 1966, Frank sold Brock's candy and more than doubled his fortune. But by then, 76-year-old Frank was wheelchair-bound, and some said senile. He and Helen rarely left their Glenview home. In 1970, Frank died, leaving Helen nearly $30 million. A poor lady from Ohio marries Mr. Rich Frank Brock, and a $30 million uh, enterprise is hers. Helen had never fit into Chicago's social elite. Alone now, she grew reclusive and eccentric. She surrounded herself with dozens of dogs. Her pets and her animal charities became her obsessions. She was not uh, one to go out on the social world. Um, she was rather quiet and reserved, but the animals became a very big part of her life. Helen's closest human companion was her employee, Jack Macklick. He took care of the estate and chauffeured Helen around. She called him her houseman. Then, in the fall of 1973, Helen let another man into her life, Richard Bailey, a charming, seemingly wealthy horse dealer. I met Helen Brock through uh, a lady at a, at a car wash. I was getting my car washed, and this lady in front of me had a beautiful new Cadillac, and so I started talking to her. She said, I know a nice lady that you'd probably like to meet. The lady's friend was Helen Brock. Of course, his ears picked up when he heard it was Helen Brock from the candy Brock heiress. Richard was in love with the high life, so she kind of filled a fantasy role for him. The pair met at a restaurant. Bailey was 20 years younger than Helen, but she felt comfortable with him. She came up in the same environment I did, from a very poor family. So Helen Brock and myself, we was like two peas in a pod. Many women found Richard Bailey appealing. Born and raised poor on an Illinois farm, Bailey had never gone beyond the ninth grade. He worked as a dance teacher and a driving instructor. But what he was best at was charming, wealthy, older women. I always called him a flim-flam man. He, he had no real um, imagination, but he was a predator of women. He was well known to be that. His favorite line was, you're a real classy lady. I did ask Richard once, uh, how can you romance these older women? And so he explained to me that, that every woman has something about them that is often very attractive. So he would concentrate on that one thing whenever he was with them um, and think about the money. <laughs> By the time he met Helen, Richard Bailey was using his charm to sell horses in Chicago. Bailey would be charming, he'd be devoted, and when a rich, lonely woman began to trust him, he'd sell her a horse. Inevitably, the woman would find out the horse was worthless, like Bailey's affections. Someone come by and look at a horse. I may take him for lunch, I may take him for dinner, and wine and dine him before you know it, they buy a horse. That's business. Helen seemed to enjoy the time she spent with Bailey. They had both started life modestly. With Bailey, Helen could be herself while still enjoying the high life. I would pick up Helen Brock at her home, bring her down to my apartment, Lake Point Towers. I would uh, make lamb chops for her, that was her favorite. And I had a panoramic view of the city of Chicago, and she really loved that. Helen was generous with Bailey, buying him presents and taking him on vacations. It was on one of their trips to Florida that Helen told him she was interested in buying some horses. She loved animals and loved the horses, and it was, gave her something uh, to do again after the death of her husband. Within a year, Brock purchased three horses from Bailey for a total of $95,000. The horses had cost him $18,000.
Helen's new horses didn't win, but Helen didn't seem to mind. She was probably, in, in, in her way, supporting Richard a little bit so that she could have the opportunity to spend the limited amount of time with him that she did. Helen gave no sign that she thought Richard was cheating her. In 1976, she was in New York City to ring in the new year, and she didn't want to do it without Richard Bailey. She says, Richard, please come. I miss you. I want to be with you that more than anyone in the whole world. She was going to pay for everything, what she did. Brock invited Bailey to the Waldorf Astoria, where the two danced the night away to the sounds of Guy Lombardo. The reclusive widow appeared to have found a cure for her loneliness. Helen planned to spend the winter of 1977 at her Florida home. But first, she checked into the Mayo Clinic for a routine examination. After a five-day stay, she was given a clean bill of health. On her way out of the hospital, Helen stopped at the Buckskin Gift Shop where she bought matching alabaster soap and powder dishes. Helen asked the saleswoman to hurry. She said that her houseman was waiting. Her transaction complete, Helen pulled on her fur coat and made her way to the exit. Helen Brock was never seen again. She might have been killed for money or for love, or maybe she knew things she wasn't supposed to know. One of Chicago's wealthiest women had seemingly vanished into thin air. When Chicago candy heiress Helen Brock disappeared in 1977, police were baffled by the lack of clues. They began questioning the people closest to her, including Helen's chauffeur and caretaker, Jack Matlick. Helen Brock called Jack Matlick her houseman, and he did a lot of things around the house. He even kept a lock of Helen's hair in a velvet-lined box next to his bed. And when the police started sniffing around, they started to smell a rat. The police hadn't found anyone who could confirm they'd seen Helen after she left the Mayo Clinic. But Matlick told them that he had seen her. He claimed she had flown home to Chicago from the Mayo Clinic and he'd picked her up at the airport. But the police thought his story didn't add up. Nobody saw Helen Brock on that plane. They couldn't find one person who saw her coming back from Minnesota. And Matlick had more. He said that a few days later, he drove Helen back to the airport to catch a plane to Florida. But when investigators checked with the airlines, they couldn't find a reservation in her name. And when they searched Helen's house, they found more evidence that made them suspect Matlick wasn't telling the truth. They found suitcase with all the clothes that she was gonna to take to Florida with the tags still on them. The houseman had repainted and recarpeted the front room shampooed her car, um, claimed to have taken her to the airport in the middle of the winter with no ticket or coat. He started signing checks with her name shortly after she disappeared, forging her name to the checks to indicate that she wasn't about to come home and catch him with that. In fact, Matlick signed Helen Brock's name to $13,000 worth of checks made out to himself and he took cash and jewelry from her safe deposit box. Matlick also destroyed some of Helen's personal papers and diaries with the help of her brother, Charles Voorhees. The two men claimed that Helen would not have wanted anyone to know her personal business. They said she had left a note asking them to burn her papers, but they hadn't saved the note. She said, if anything happens to me, burn these, and within a couple of days, they burned all the diaries. How did they know anything had happened to her? Matlick's behavior seemed to show that he knew Helen would never come back. The question was, how did he know it if he wasn't involved in her disappearance somehow? But there was another suspect, Richard Bailey, 
the horse trader and notorious playboy that Helen had been romantically involved with. Bailey claimed that he had no idea what happened to Helen. He said he was in Florida waiting to meet her and that she had never turned up. I just assumed that, uh, that she must have been out with another man. But I kept calling and calling from, uh, from uh, Florida. I couldn't believe it, though, that she just dumped me that fast. When police checked his story, it seemed at least part of it was true. Phone records showed a call from Bailey in Florida to Helen at the Mayo Clinic. Bailey had a shaky alibi, and Matlick had behaved oddly, but the investigation went no further. The two men in Helen Brock's life, Richard Bailey and Jack Matlick, were both dependent on her for money. And it looked like one of them may have killed her. But without a body or a murder weapon, police couldn't lay a hand on either one of them. You don't have a body, baby. You got a problem. You don't know if she were hit on the head with a blunt instrument indicating a sudden quarrel. You don't know if this were premeditated. Did someone cut her up? Where is she buried? Is she buried? It seemed that Helen Brock, one of Chicago's richest women, had just vanished. For two years, there was no movement on the case. Then, in red spray paint, scrawled across a road near Helen's estate, a message appeared. It said, Richard Bailey knows where Mrs. Brock's body is. Stop him, please. A lot of speculation went on that it could have been some of the horse people who were jealous of, of Richard's business and uh, location and were really headed in for Richard. One of the horse people sprayed dead out there in front. All, all the horse people that hated me because I was my own person. Two years after Helen Brock's disappearance, Police wanted to talk to Richard Bailey again. The detectives came over from Glenview and questioned me on a few things, but my attorney, she says, get rid of those people, don't even talk to them. The case was at a dead end. Without a body, a motive, or a weapon, the police couldn't prove there was even a murder, let alone pin anything on Bailey. In February 1984, seven years after she disappeared, the state of Illinois declared Helen Brock officially dead. When her will was finally executed, the bulk of her fortune, nearly $30 million, went to charities that took care of animals. Brock's brother, Charles Voorhees, inherited $500,000. Jack Matlick got $50,000. For the next 10 years, the case languished and the legend of the missing heiress grew. She's become a far more interest in death than she was in life. Everyone from Chicago um, who can read a paper, listen to the radio, watch television, was aware of the mystery of Helen Brock. It was perhaps the most famous unsolved crime in Chicago history. But in 1989, the case of Helen Brock was about to move out of history and back into the headlines. Assistant U.S. Attorney Stephen Miller, who had just won a high-profile case involving fraud and murder, heard that a woman named Barbara Morris had filed a lawsuit, claiming that she had been swindled out of $50,000 on a horse deal by a dashing con man. He had no criminal record. He had never even been arrested. But the rumors were he had done this in the past to other women and that he had dated Helen Brock. Miller was from Chicago and had been in law school when Helen Brock disappeared. The case had always fascinated him. And when I realized the potential was there to open up the long and salt Brock case, I went for it. Prosecutor Steve Miller was no fool. He knew that fraud and murder go hand in hand. So he followed the money trail and turned up a con man with a history of complaints against him, Richard Bailey. No investigator had ever gathered enough evidence to indict anyone for the murder of Helen Brock. Miller was hoping to change that. Who wouldn't want to solve the Helen Brock case? I mean, that um, would be a great feather in anybody's hat. 
Miller dug deep into Bailey's background and found a string of lawsuits filed against him by wealthy women, all claiming that Bailey had sold them worthless horses for exorbitant sums of money. He was representing these horses as being winning horses and horses of great value, when indeed many were already even crippled. They were not what he was claiming they were. Woman after woman after woman after woman, all accusing Bailey and the same group of people of having defrauded them. And the deeper Miller looked, the more convinced he was that Bailey was more than just a shady horse trader. Twelve years after candy heiress Helen Brock disappeared, a young attorney named Steve Miller stumbled upon the name of a con man who had once been involved with Brock, Richard Bailey. Experience taught Miller that fraud and murder sometimes go hand in hand. I would resurrect long uh, unsolved and dormant murder investigations, and I would attack the cases not as murders but as financial crimes and I develop a, a little methodology that I, I would refer to as follow the fraud solve the murder and he thought he may have found a break in the Brock case Steve Miller was a very smart guy and a very ambitious one he was looking for a case that would put his name on the map and he found it in Helen Brock's disappearance it was a sexy story. High-profile names, low-life criminals, money, and murder. Miller probed into Bailey's background and learned that Bailey had been swindling women for decades. What emerged was a portrait of a born con man. Richard Bailey began fleecing women in St. Louis where he ran a driving school. It was any kind of a way of, of getting money away from the women, from conning them to, to uh, having them spend hours and hours and hours learning how to drive and then, you know, when they run out of money and can't pass the driver's test, you know, who cares? And that's as long as he's got his money. When St. Louis authorities caught on to Bailey, he packed up and moved to Chicago, where he got into the horse business. His realization was there was no better vehicle for committing a fraud than a horse. He understood people who are attracted to horses have a lot of money. So it was an ideal place for him to be uh, with a product that has no blue book value and more women with money than not. And that is where he met the Jane family. A lot of big bunny people around the horse business. And the Janes basically would, would always control the horse shows because most of the people was always afraid of them. He was conned by them and bought a horse. That's how Bailey decided that he should get into this racket. The Janes were notorious and ruthless gangsters whose operation centered on the sale and showing of horses. The Chicago police called them the Horse Mafia. They weren't just con men. There were some vicious, vicious people who would take advantage of women, um, even to the point of committing murder. He was their front man. He was their con man who brought him in, and the other men really did the selling. I think Bailey found a group of people with the same um, morals and standards that he had himself, which was how to make money, how to um, take advantage of women through a variety of schemes. Bailey found his marks by running personal ads in the newspaper. His ad was about as accurate as most personal ads are. It said he had a red Mercedes, his own business, liked fine dining, and was a Leo. That part, at least, was true. He was looking for lonely women who had huge emotional voids in their lives that needed to be filled. And then when the woman felt um, confident with him, uh, when, when he knew the women would confide in him emotionally, he also knew they would confide in him financially. 
But Miller still had no proof that Bailey had been involved in Helen Brock's disappearance. Then he got his first break in the case. He received a tip about another kind of murder. A man named Tom Burns was going to travel from Chicago to Florida with a horse in his horse trailer. And once there, he would have the horse killed in order to commit a livestock insurance fraud. He was known to be the number one hired hitman in the horse show circuit. The horse he set knew all about Tom Burns, but nobody talked about him. He was the guy you went to when you had a problem that wouldn't go away. Burns was called the Sandman. He put horses to sleep. There's only two things would happen when Tommy Burns was at a horse show. A horse would die and horse tack would disappear. He was either stealing or killing. In 1991, Tommy Burns was arrested in Florida and charged with killing a horse. Miller flew down to question him, hoping he might know something about Richard Bailey and Helen Brock. Tommy Burns uh, told the story of his role as, as the executioner of horses uh, for wealthy people who owned horses and no longer wanted them. Burns said he didn't know anything about the candy heiress, but Miller wanted to know more about the Sandman's dirty dealings. He was executing horses for the who's who of the equestrian world, the hunter-jumper world, people who lived on vast equestrian estates, people who dabbled in some of the most expensive livestock around. If the horse could no longer perform, and then it was, uh, you know, an unnecessary burden on a wealthy person uh, to care for the horse, to take, uh, to pay for uh, the maintenance of the horse. Then, Burns told Miller about a job he did for George Lindemann, Jr., the son of one of the wealthiest men in America. Lindemann was an Olympic hopeful who rode a quarter of a million dollar horse named Charisma. But he was having trouble with his horse. He couldn't train Charisma to be a winner. I frustrated him, embarrassed him. He was being beaten by other horses that were 10% of the purchase price. If the horse started to show its talent with another rider, then George Linderman's lack of talent would show up. Rather than just give the horse away or buy another one, he hired Tommy Burns to electrocute the horse and collect the insurance proceeds. The young millionaire collected $250,000 in insurance money. Burns then told Miller about dozens of trainers and owners who simply disposed of disappointing horses and collected millions of insurance dollars. That part of the dirty little secrets of the horse industry gave Miller the leverage to get everybody in the horse business talking about everybody else. For moral scuzziness, it's hard to beat the Chicago horse world. Every time Steve Miller looked under a rock, another con man would slither out. It was hard to tell who was telling the truth. You needed a scorecard to keep track of all the informers. The most important one was a crooked horse trader named Joe Plemons. Plemons was facing serious jail time for horse fraud. When he heard that Miller was looking for information, he decided to make a deal. He told Miller that he knew why Helen Brock disappeared and who was responsible for it. Joe Plemons, who became a key government witness in this case, was very familiar with Richard Bailey, had done business with Richard Bailey. Joe Plemons seemed to be the key to the case. He had a story to tell that looked like it could finally unlock the mystery of Helen Brock's disappearance. After three years of trying to build a case against Richard Bailey, federal investigator Steve Miller was growing frustrated. He could connect the con man and the missing candy heiress, 
but he couldn't come up with a strong motive for the crime. Then Miller got lucky. A horse trader and con man named Joe Plemons told Miller that Helen Brock had been on to Bailey and that she was planning to turn him into the police. The candy heiress had been a sweet deal for Richard Bailey, but if she had seen through his con, all bets were off, and Bailey had a motive for murder. We had witnesses, not to the murder itself, but everything leading up to the murder, including his solicitation of her murder. That Richard Bailey had solicited, we think, to have Mrs. Brock murdered. Plemons said that Bailey had offered him $5,000 to kill Helen Brock to keep her quiet. The story made sense to Miller, but Plemons was far from the ideal witness. Plemons had been a con man all his life, cheated everybody, everything. Plemons evidently just sold some woman a horse for $175,000 and it cost him $10,000. He's been locked up all of his life, off and on for like about 20 years prior to this. Bailey said Joe Plemons was lying. How could you listen to a con man? And Plemons said Bailey was lying. He was the con man. They were all con men. But Steve Miller was convinced that Bailey was involved with Helen Brock's disappearance. Bailey wasn't just a con artist. Miller had evidence that he could be ruthless. There was a woman named Linda Holmwood who is, was as sad and tragic as, as a person can be. Um, she was divorced. She suffered from severe alcoholism. She was an end-stage alcoholic. She was friendless, and Bailey immediately recognized that she might be a particularly easy pigeon, as he would refer to them, because she had so few emotional and intellectual resources left. And suddenly, this poor woman has a white knight. She thinks her whole life is turned around. But all Bailey had done for Linda Holmwood, according to Miller, was give her champagne and sell her several worthless horses. When he was done with her, she was penniless and alone. Bailey's crimes against the women were so, so cold-blooded in nature that um, I believed he was capable of playing a role in a murder. After nearly five years of investigating, Miller finally had enough evidence to take to a grand jury. You link the pieces up. Bailey is a serial con man. Um, He's gotten in over his head because he's taken down a very prominent, powerful figure in Chicago. The person is threatening to imminently go to the authorities and have him prosecuted. And then, poof, suddenly she's gone. Miller asked the grand jury to indict Bailey on 29 charges, ranging from fraud to conspiracy to murder. He outlined a series of crimes committed by Bailey and the ruthless Jane gang over 20 years. Because it was ongoing fraud, Miller could bring racketeering charges against Bailey and claim that Helen's murder was part of a larger criminal pattern. On July 27, 1994, 17 years after she disappeared, a grand jury indicted Bailey for conspiring to murder Helen Brock. Richard Bailey, the galloping gigolo, has killed his last widow and defrauded his last victim. To silence Helen Brock, Bailey conspired, solicited, and caused her murder. The grand jury also indicted 21 other people, most of them for crimes related to the killing of horses for insurance money. Richard Bailey admitted he'd swindled women, but he claimed he'd never cheated Helen and he said that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. Bailey had a choice to make. He could let a jury decide his fate on all 29 counts, including the conspiracy murder charge, or plead guilty to some of the charges and hope that the judge would go easy on him in sentencing. The jury might find him guilty because he had so much baggage uh, with all these women talking about the frauds. Bailey decided not to set foot in front of a jury. He made a deal. He pled guilty to 16 counts of the indictment, counts that did not involve the murder of Helen Brock. And the legal strategy was he would take the case away from a jury, which might view things somewhat emotionally, 
and put it in front of a judge. But at sentencing, if Judge Milton Shader thought that evidence pointed toward Bailey's guilt in the Helen Brock disappearance, 65-year-old Bailey could spend the rest of his life in prison. It was a gamble, but Bailey was a man used to taking risks. The hearing began on May 22, 1995. It was the biggest crime story in town. Was Richard Bailey just a sleazy con man, or was he a killer? After 17 years, it seemed like the public was going to find out what had really happened to Helen Brock. In 1995, 18 years after her disappearance, U.S. Attorney Steve Miller indicted Richard Bailey on charges of swindling and conspiring to kill millionaire candy heiress Helen Brock. Bailey waived his right to a jury trial and agreed to let a judge decide his fate at a sentencing hearing. A consummate con man, he walked into court convinced that he'd beat the conspiracy to murder charge. Bailey was a charismatic guy. That's what he'd counted on all his life. In fact, insiders at the trial joked that if they didn't get the female deputies out of the courtroom, Bailey would charm them into letting him go. Before the judge, Miller explained how Bailey operated. He would offer his lonely victims companionship, sometimes even promise marriage. Then he sold them worthless horses creating phony partnerships and racking up fake stable charges. All too often, the women were left humiliated and penniless. So when, when someone is willing to degrade another human being to that level, um, it's not a very big leap from that to murder. Miller said that Bailey had taken advantage of Helen Brock the same way. And when Helen caught on and threatened to go to the police, Bailey had her killed. But Bailey's lawyer said that Miller's case was purely circumstantial. He took some loosely connected facts, um, tenuous connections of Bailey to this horse world fraud, and there was no evidence proving that he had anything to do with Helen Brock's murder. In fact, the defense said Helen had made money on the horses Bailey sold her. Some of them were winning races. So they weren't nags. So that whole part of the, the government's case, I think, is very flawed. Furthermore, argued his lawyer, murder was out of character for the lifelong con man. If he was in trouble, he'd just turn on the charm. He didn't fear that he would be prosecuted. Richard always was a believer he could talk his way out of anything. But the prosecution countered. This time, Bailey was in over his head. Helen Brock was the richest woman Bailey had ever conned, and that made a difference. Mrs. Brock uh, was one of the wealthiest women in Chicago, and she could bring down the powers of law enforcement in this area. She planned to go to the state's attorney's office. She planned to use her wealth and influence on Richard Bailey and his co-schemers. Joe Plemons testified that Bailey told him Helen had caught on to his con and offered Plemons $5,000 to kill her. But Plemons was a convicted con man himself who was getting a reduced sentence in exchange for his testimony. Those are like the weakest kind of witnesses. You don't want to depend on witnesses like that. Finally, the defense brought up the suspicious behavior of Helen's houseman, Jack Matlick. Matlick, who was the, the caretaker, I think the biggest fingers pointed in his direction. Matlick had forged Helen's checks, destroyed her personal papers, and had her house recarpeted, all within a few weeks of her disappearance. There were some bizarre things that went on with, with Jack Matlick. Did he, in fact, have something to do with the murder? The answer is, I don't know for sure. That, that's a part of the investigation that's still kind of clouded. Matlick had told police that he brought Helen to the airport to catch a plane to Florida just a few days after she came back from the Mayo Clinic. As soon as she returned from the Mayo Clinic, she was gonna go to the authorities. She had, she had it on her calendar, essentially. Put Richard Bailey behind bars. If she was going to 
to uh, go to the state's attorney's office or wherever she's going to go, and she got back. I'm surprised she wound up at the airport then. Why didn't she go as soon as she came back? The details of Matlick's behavior could have raised reasonable doubt with a jury. Even Judge Shader wondered why there were no charges brought against Jack Matlick. But Matlick wasn't the one on trial. The judge could only weigh the evidence brought before him. A trial is about the evidence, not the truth. The sentencing hearing of Richard Bailey had been full of charges and countercharges, speculation, and unanswered questions. After three weeks, Judge Shader was ready to deliver a verdict. He wrote a 41-page opinion explaining it. On June 6, 1995, Judge Shader found there was a preponderance of evidence that Richard Bailey orchestrated the murder of Helen Brock. Bailey had gambled his whole life with women and the law, and this time he lost. Richard Bailey was sentenced to 30 years in a medium security federal prison. From prison, Richard Bailey still maintains he had nothing to do with Helen Brock's disappearance. It's uh, no way, shape, or form that I know anything, whatever happened to Helen Brock. If she could roll out of her grave or whatever she might be, I guarantee you she'd hang Steve Miller right now, without a doubt. By the end of Miller's five-year investigation, 36 people were charged with crimes in the horse business, including Tom Sandman Burns, Joe Plemons, and George Lindemann Jr. Jack Matlick, who was never charged with anything having to do with the disappearance of Helen Brock, now lives just a short drive from where Helen grew up. And despite the conviction of Richard Bailey, the mystery of the missing heiress wasn't over. You can find people to express a point of view on any subject. And, you know, there's a cottage industry on the Helen Brock case. The only thing that would bring closure to this, I guess, would be a body. This thing has layers and layers. Richard and his group were the obvious. And so it goes on as being part of the mystique uh, connected to the horse business. Helen Brock is still missing. In a cemetery in her hometown of Unionport, Ohio, stands the elaborate monument that she had built to mark her final resting place. Underneath that monument lie Helen's parents, her husband Frank, and her two beloved dogs, Candy and Sugar. But Helen's grave is empty. Her body has never been found. Chicago's most confounding case was solved, but exactly what happened to Helen Brock remains a mystery. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.